At first, we have Professor Achyut Sankar Naya, and he's going to talk about Scilab opportunities and challenges. Sir, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to come back to my alma mater. I studied in the Pawai campus 26 years ago. This is the first time I'm coming back after 26 years. So you can understand. <laughs> you can you can imagine you know how nostalgic I am. But actually, I didn't get to see the campus. I just drove straight here to the Samir guest house, and here I am. Um, I have 20 minutes, so it's easy to say because I have only a few things to say. Um, I come from the University of Kerala. This is the this is my university, 74-year-old university. I head the Department of Computation, Biology, and Bioinformatics. This is my den. These are some of my students. That's my son. And I'm going to talk a little about what I know of Scilab, of open source uh, movement in Kerala. Uh, I would like to say that I'm connected to the open source movement in Kerala when I wrote a book about free software and Linux way back in 2002 in Malayalam so that it would spread among the common people. Uh, I think you know that in Kerala, all the schools teach uh, Linux. None of the school children know about Windows, all the school children. So it's a place where uh, free software has deep roots. I was for the last maybe about 15 years, and I'm very happy that I played my humble role as a communicator, as a university teacher. I'm asked to talk about challenges, opportunities and challenge. I think the biggest challenge that Scilab has is everybody calls it Skylab. You know? <laughs> and uh, Well, MATLAB is not without woes. Uh, we used to make fun of our senior colleague. Uh, he got a CD, demo CD of MATLAB, quite in early days. And uh, he didn't know what this was. He said, somebody has sent me a trailer of a new mo movie called MATLAB. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to me, as I see Scilab, you know, it is identity is changing. And uh, its uh, future is different, maybe firmer. But I see that now it comes under the banner of uh, a, a company, Scilab Enterprises. And this is the most uh, noticeable change that I can point out to you. I think that Scilab, of course, suffers from uh, the lack of support in the same scale as MATLAB has. I have two screen captures here. You search for Scilab in Google Books, you get about 4,000 and odd hits, whereas it is exactly uh, 100 times more in MATLAB. This indicates you know, the kind of literature content that is available on the public domain, which people can rely on. And perhaps why I am called to speak here is that we address this in our humble way. Uh, my wife and myself, we wrote a book. They got the title itself wrong. You know? <laughs> they wrote the Scilab Free Software to MATLAB. And nobody seems to care. <laughs> what we wrote was a free software alternative to MATLAB. Inside everything is fine, but on the cover they printed like this. When you print in big letters, you don't notice mistakes. You, know? you write in ordinary letters, people notice. We are all human. Okay, so this book is written in such a way that it doesn't talk about an alternative to MATLAB, only on the cover it says. It teaches Scilab from ground up as if it is a new package. And we don't assume that we are trying to compete with MATLAB or anything. Uh, and it is written in a very lucid textbook style, very simple stuff. And it goes up to toolboxes, including the uh, systems toolbox, image processing toolbox. And uh, the focus has been more on uh, the pedagogy of how this is to be done, rather than anything else. And uh, my <laughs> appeal to the August uh, gathering here is that uh, the Scilab India conference must take a call on the issue of integration in, of Scilab in curriculum. I think if uh, such an August gathering can pass a resolution and then it can be communicated by nobody less than Professor Kannan to all the vice chancellors of the universities in India saying uh, or calling upon them uh, and uh, kind of uh, uh, debating the relevance of Scilab in curriculum and how it needs to be taken as a first preference for uh, programs where the scientific computing is involved. 
uh, we wouldn't uh, be very prescriptive. Rather, we would say that there must be a, a serious consideration for Scilab as uh, a supporting tool for maths, engineering, and science programs. Uh, if the policy, if the governments can take a policy, like in Ireland, of Kerala has taken a policy on schools that they wouldn't have any proprietary software in education process. But in higher education, as you know, in school education, Kerala is uh, uh, far ahead uh, in literacy in what the schools do. But in university, it is uh, kind of the other way around. The universities are far behind the schools in Kerala. That is what I would say in terms of pedagogy, in terms of adopting technology, in terms of changes. That is how things go. And uh, uh, there is an outfit called Higher Education Council now in every state. Kerala was one of the first to set up. I was a member of the first uh, founding council. It would be the right body to be addressed. You write to them and say, why don't you give a call to the universities? That would be a single point for every state. If they pass a policy resolution saying that every university must seriously consider adopting uh, Scilab as a scientific computing tool wherever the curriculum requires, that would be a good point to start with. I would like to say my department, which we call fondly as DCB, Department of Computational Biology, we are not guilty. We have integrated Scilab for a very long time into our curriculum. Maths also has got a laboratory, and that laboratory also runs on Scilab. We have, we have a very good team of young people in, in my department who promote uh, Scilab and uh, are after it. Now, one suggestion that I thought I would make here in the very brief interaction with you is that uh, the, the toolboxes, or I, I think it is also referred to as modules, and I feel I got, um, they are rather uh, limited uh, in terms of numbers and in terms of their scope. And I'm sure that everybody agrees that this needs to be, the baseline is there, but this needs to be strengthened and needs to be widened in a very carefully decided manner. Not that we will chase the whole uh, stuff, but we have to be choosy. And my suggestion I will come up with. Um, uh, I've, I've tried using the uh, system toolbox also, and I uh, found that you know that is one area where the whole engineering education would be very keen about. But my focus is uh, on suggesting. Okay, we we know about atoms and uh, about a Scilab toolbox for bioinformatics. I, I will just take a couple of minutes to argue my case. Yeah. Well, the relevance of bioinformatics is you know life is a very colorful, very curious, very complex, and very beautiful phenomena that unfolds every second in the uh, universe and on definitely on Earth. We do not know about anywhere else. And we cannot leave it to a single discipline to study. And biology is the discipline which had this way over this topic. But today, we have so many bios, bio X, biochemistry, biophysics, biomathematics, bio, second one is biostatistics, biotechnology, and then why not bioinformatics? You know, you study life through studying chemistry, you study life through studying its physics, you study life through studying its mathematics, you study life through studying its informatics. That is the whole idea. And uh, we have, this is an area where traditionally uh, free uh, open, open source ideas have taken root. Biology itself is more or less open biology. You know, if you sequence a DNA, there is no use if you keep the DNA to yourself until you publish it and you compare it with all the existing other sequences, the information is redundant. It would almost be like buying a telephone and say that I don't want anybody to exploit it, so I won't connect it to the telephone network. I'll just keep it to myself. Just like that, you know, uh, the knowledge in new biology is, uh, it has value only when it is opened up and when it is available for other people to analyze. So that means there is a very good uh, foundation there for uh, the free software uh, activity to take place. Now, I would just like to say, you know, uh, today uh, with a drop of blood or spit from a person, we are able to spend about 1.5 lakhs of rupees. Then in about 12 hours, half a day, uh, it should be possible for, possible for us to get the information of the whole DNA of this person into five or six CDs. Now, this is the American dream of $1,000 genome sequencing. We are very close to that. But the point is, why I want to say why we have to have a toolbox is that the sequencing is $1,000. Maybe we will get it in another two or three years. But the analysis is a, still a million dollars. It is like buying a large number of books. You say, I got these books cheap. They're all in German, Latin, Greek, and all that. They're all up there in your shelf. All the knowledge that you need 
to lead the world is there, but you cannot read. So the job is only uh, begun. You have got a way of capturing very valuable information, but then you need to go ahead to know how to analyze it. And this has come as the mainstay for the new biology. The way that biology works today is like that. Any uh, biologist who gets a new virus or a, a, they find a new plant or they find a new or animal, what they do is they sequence. They do a genome sequencing or even shorter sequences. And then they run to the new, you know, when television came into being, we called it the idiot box. Today, the idiot box is not television. Still, maybe idiot. But uh, the small, long, rectang rectangular box in Google, that must be the idiot box. You know, that is where people rush. Some people, in, it's, it's said in the morning, they get, uh, get up, start Google, put their name in it and see what Google says to reassure themselves, you know. So biologists actually have a passion like that, obsession like that. The biologist would, the moment they find a new organism or a virus or an animal or a plant, they would like to sequence and throw that sequence into the Google of biology called BLAST and then say what BLAST says. Even today, uh, the proof for, the, the living proof for uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is that you do your sequence or this beautiful lady takes her sequence and throws it into blast, she would be shocked because the closest match is an orangutan, you know, which is a very empirical uh, proof for Darwin's theory. So what I'm saying is that bioinformatics has come to stay. Biology itself has become transformed and it's called new biology and its scope and nature is very, very important. You know, uh, to in, in biology people say uh, if in, in 21st century, uh, we, we, you know, this is a place of technology, but uh, you, it, it might be a bit uh, odd to say this. Uh, 21st century is a century of biology, new biology. You know, the big, biggest industrial process is going to be uh, happening in bacteria, not in industrial houses. You, you must have seen recently the BBC carried this uh, video called uh, Man Plays God, which is, of course, a very popular title all over in which uh, uh, it is shown that in an American university they have got a bacteria to produce alcohol industrially and then that is used to run a vehicle, you know, because bacteria is capable of doing that as we know that, you know, the fermentation is done by a microbe. That means it can produce alcohol. So that means from nature you just give food, you know, waste uh, green uh, biomass can be given Bacteria would convert that to diesel, and then your problem with, you know, war for the petrol and diesel is over. Bacteria can do this. It's just a tip of the iceberg. Everything can be done by the bacteria. All industrial production gets transformed to bacteria. This is the context in which bioinformatics is extremely important. I believe it is extremely important. Not in a standalone basis. It, of course, combines with a larger number of other disciplines, but it is very important. Am I about to get a bell? Five more minutes. Yeah, I'll finish. So uh, th these are some of the tasks that uh, biologists today need. It is no longer a science. It is more of an applied science and technology, actually, I would say. It is even engineering. You know, engineers uh, are concerned with man-made or human-made things like bridges, computers, mobile phones, and all. Biologist is very happily settled with his interest in things which occur in nature, the tomato or the frog, which is already there, but the computer and the mobile phone is not there in nature, it is human made. But now they have changed. They want to produce things which are not in nature, and therefore they become engineers. So they, they need a lot of technical support. And, you know, just remember this, you know, would you think that the system toolbox is of any relevance to a bioinformatician? Normally you wouldn't, because this is for engineers. But just imagine, how important that uh, system uh, modeling is for, an for a biologist. It is much more important than that for an engineer. If an electrical engineer is pulled up and asked what would happen if I connect a transmission line between such a point A and point B in the power grid, then you can run a power flow and then come back with an answer, saying that you know, if you do that, the voltage will drop here, this transformer will be overloaded, that will happen, this will happen. But if you call a, a, a doctor, or a, or a scientist and ask, what would happen if I increase the pH level inside the cell nucleus by 10%? What will happen? The other question of the power grid can be answered in maybe an hour. You just need to set up the power flow and run it. But the, doc, the doctor or the scientist would come back and say, 
with a big proposal and say, okay, give me one crore rupees, you give me uh, three postdoctoral fellows and the five PhD students, and what will I do? I will go and change the pH and see what happens. This is what <laughs> the scientist would do. So why? Because there is no rigorous mathematical model of what happens inside the cell. We have a model of what happens in a transformer, what happens in a, in a steam engine, you know, <laughs> but we don't have a mathematical model of what the cell is. Of course, it is not comparable, it may not be as easy as that. If you can produce, then we would be able to say, if this drug is injected, what would happen can be predicted in an engineering fashion, you know, like a perturbation analysis after the system network is produced. A large number of new areas are emerging. We need to have this toolbox in place. Otherwise, a lot of uh, people who work in this emerging area would run to MATLAB. That is why I just, I, I just imagine that I've argued the case. Just for you to remember, this is what bioinformatics will help the new biologist to do. Just like we copy pieces of code from one program to another, you can copy pieces of DNA from one organism to another. You just want me to stop in two minutes. Yeah. Uh, so if you do that, we get the programs like this. One, uh, one function is taken from one program, pasted into another. If you do it properly, then it will run here, produce an appropriate result. You know the uh, how the data is transferred and all has to be done properly. You could get any, uh, the uh, result of any organism to run in the human body. You can grow rose flowers in your head. If you want to be a hot woman, you can grow chili and you know. And uh, you know, I'm a basically an electrical engineer. I think that the solution to our power crisis is this. Nature has a, a light producing program, which is written in the DNA of uh, the firefly. Just copy that, and the best place to put it is in the human body. And uh, But uh, government don't permit, so scientists have put it into that of a rabbit, and they've produced a glowing rabbit. You go to the net and search for GFP, you will find details of this. Green fluorescent protein bunny, that is what it is called. And if you put it in human beings, then you know when the electricity goes, you just switch on your cells. And then there is enough light for you to at least read a book. This is also possible. And at our department, we have launched this toolbox exercise with some funding that we have. We call it BTD, Bioinformatics Toolbox from DCD. Maybe if it is a more uh, general uh, thing, we can change its name. And we have, we have asked students to contribute like this. The PhD students, their major, one of their deliverables would be if they are doing computational work, that should come as a tool in the uh, toolbox. And uh, student projects of MSc, it may be non-unique, but they must also produce tools. Even case studies and mini projects, they are all required to be produced as small tools. And then people are also encouraged to make personal contributions, you know, sitting at home and writing a small code to do the basic statistical analysis of a DNA sequence is not at all very challenging. So, uh, and we want to replicate all the functions in MATLAB. We have started this about uh, seven, eight months ago. We'll carry on this, and I look forward to uh, support from the Scilab community in India as well as elsewhere. Uh, I don't think I need to show this. We, we keep the students away from all issues. We tell them, you write in C and give it to us. We, we have a person who will ensure that it is linked to Scilab and put it into the toolbox. We also ask them to uh, write a standard uh, in, uh, help information, which also we port. So they're not nuisanced with any kind of technicalities. They can write in whatever language they want. Some of them write in Python, some of them in Perl. Uh, not all of them are equally easy to integrate, but uh, we, we have one person who worries about this, and they manage this. I just had the screenshots of a sample. The students were doing. Of course, we know that we have atoms which uh, manages. You, you have your toolbox, uh, uh, and it is managed by the atoms package. That uh, We don't ask these contributors to get involved in any of this. They just need to write in their own favorite language and hand over the code after proper testing and uh, help. I think I've run out of my time. Thank you very much. I look forward to a call, uh, a kind of a resolution from this conference, which I will be able to take home and uh, push my vice chancellor to adopt it as a policy of the University of Kerala. Thank you very much.